Oh, good evening, everybody. Good to see you here on this Tuesday night, the 16th of April. Danny Gutierrez is here to lead us in worship. We're going to be doing four psalms tonight, three that are kind of together, and then we get Psalm 22, which is amazing to close out the night. So that's our plan. Why don't we all stand for opening prayer and just commit the night to the Lord and prepare our hearts. Lord, we are blessed to be here. We are grateful for this sanctuary and that you meet us here in this sanctuary and all that we're going through in spirit, mind, body, our emotions, just all that life brings us. We come in here and we get that calibration on life for the kingdom. And we thank you for that. Please bless this gathering for the worship toward you, the songs we sing about you and to you. Please bless the teaching of your word. And as we look at these Psalms, these books that are unique in the Bible, these Psalms, uh, that they would speak to our hearts and minister to us in who we are and where we're at tonight as individuals and as a church family. So we give you the night, and we pray, as always, that you be glorified, and we ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy Through every trial my soul will sing no turning back I've been set free Christ is enough for salvation and this hope will never fail for heaven is our home through every storm my soul will sing Jesus is here to God be the No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. Christ is enough for me, Christ is enough for me, everything I need is Everything I need, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need.
Jesus, Lord of heaven, I do not deserve the grace that you have given or the promise of your word. Lord, I stand in wonder at the sacrifice you made. Mercy beyond measure, my day you freely pay. Cause your love is deeper than any ocean higher than the heavens reaches beyond the stars in the sky. That Jesus, your love has no bounds. 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 Jesus, Lord of heaven. I do not deserve the grace that you have given or the promise of your word. Lord, I stand in wonder at the sacrifice you made. Mercy beyond measure my day you freely pay cause your love is deeper than any ocean higher than the heavens reaches beyond the stars in the sky Jesus your love has no bounds 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 cause your love is deeper than any ocean higher and the heavens reaches beyond the stars in the sky. Jesus, your love has no bounds. 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 I need you. To soften my heart and break me apart, I need you to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my life. All I am, I surrender. Give me faith to trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my life, I give you my life, I 
need you. I need you to soften my heart, to break me apart. I need you to pierce through the dark and cleanse every part of me. All I what you say that you're good and your love is great I'm broken inside I give you my life oh I may be weak but your spirit's strong in me my flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. Give me faith to trust what you say that you're good and your love is great i'm broken inside i give you my life give me faith give me faith to trust what you say that you're good and your love is great I'm broken inside I give you my life I may be weak, yeah I may be weak But your spirit's strong in me My flesh may fail my God, you never will. I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail. My God, you never will. I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail. My God, you never will. creation all of the earth make straight a highway a path for the lord jesus is coming soon call back the sinner wake up the saint let every nation shout of your fame Jesus is coming soon Like a bride Like a bride Waiting for her groom We'll be a church Ready for you every hour Longing for our King We sing Even so come Lord Jesus, come. Even so, come. Lord Jesus, come. 
There will be justice, all will be new. Your name forever, faithful and true. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride ready for her groom, will be church ready for you every hour. God, we wait your coming soon. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait your coming. Above, 
Humbly you came to the earth you created All for love's sake became poor mm. Here I am to worship Here I am to bow down Here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Jesus, we thank you that we can praise you and thank you as freely as we can. We thank you that we know what you did for us on that cross. It just changed the trajectory of humanity. We thank you that we can run to you at this very moment, in this very hour. We thank you that you're the rock on which we stand, Jesus. We stand upon you when the winds come and they hit us. The house will not break. We will be safe. And Lord, we love you. We pray that in this time that we would just be sensitive to what you have to tell us through your living word. Holy Spirit, minister the truth to us. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. You guys can greet each other. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, all right, once again, good evening, everyone. Nice to have you out on this Tuesday night. A couple of announcements before we get into the book of Psalms. And we're going to have, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be doing four Psalms tonight. But as I mentioned on Saturday night, I'm leaving for Florida tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing my wife. Jennifer's been in Florida for about a week now with the grandkids, and I will be joining her. And so she made her really good cookies the other day, those that know, know. And um, the grandkids are like pleading for more of grandma's cookies. And she said, when Papa Joe gets here, you get them. So it just added my value. Uh, in the eyes of the grandkids, I'm going to show up. And Jennifer's going to make her awesome cookies. And it'll be another wonderful thing associated with Grandpa Joe. That's, you know, that's, guys, I'm just telling you younger people, that's the way it works. When you get a little bit older, that's how you want it to be. So I uh, appreciate your prayers for me traveling tomorrow. And then I'll, again, I leave very early tomorrow morning at LAX. I'll be afternoon in Fort Lauderdale and then headed north up to Vero Beach. And then there for a little over a week, I'm actually teaching at Vero Beach on Thursday night. So that's the first time I'm teaching the main sanctuary. I've taught the youth. I guess I did okay because I'm going to be teaching the main sanctuary. Um, so yeah, Jim Gallagher is in Europe or in the Mediterranean doing a Paul, John the Apostle kind of tour with a tour group. And Nate and Shane are, are running the church, the, the sons, including my son-in-law, Nate, and they're like, what are we going to do at Thursday? Like, let's get Joey to teach it. So I'm not sure if Jim actually signed off on it, but, uh, you know, it, we won't burn the house down, and we'll just keep it under 45 minutes, and that'll do well, all right? So I'm, pray I'm teaching Thursday night, so you can pray for me. I feel like I know what I want to teach, too, so I'm looking forward to it. So I'm going to get there on Wednesday, teach on Thursday, and then really I hit vacation mode on Friday with Jennifer and the grandkids, and then we'll be coming back the following Friday, the 26th. So we'll get back into the SNA, Santa Ana, through the ATL and the MLB. That's Melbourne, Florida, to Atlanta, Delta, to Santa Ana. So we'll get home a week from this Friday, which means I'll miss this coming Saturday. Sam will be teaching, and Danny will be doing worship with his sister Olivia. And then the following Tuesday, when you're here next Tuesday, Danny Donnelly will be doing worship, and Sam will be teaching. And then I'll be coming back, like I said, on Friday. So I miss two services. Also, Pastor Brandon Phillips, who we all love very much and miss since he went to go start the church, Headlands down there in Dana Point, he'll be up here for both those services. So if you want to hear all the exciting things about what God's doing with the new church plant, it's been amazing. I didn't know, I didn't, you know, he was here for a year and a half. Of course, he was my assistant coach with the U.S. surf team for two years. We became great friends through coaching. And then he came here, he was already involved in ministry with South Orange County, came here for like an internship for about a year and a half, and now he's planted the church. And, you know, I've planted some churches, so you, it's, you're so nervous with that first service. And they had like 60 people and all these kids, and I'm like, man, you're, you're way ahead of the curve. I, I mean, you're always afraid when you start a church, no one's coming, just so you know. Like, if you're ever going to plant a church and you're part of it, and you're thinking, you go to bed like, no one's coming, like, you know, that's, that's normal. All right, so it's awesome. All those people came, and they're meeting on Monday nights, just getting traction by the week. And so Brandon will be here, and if Sam's adventurous, maybe we'll have Brandon share a little, a little update or something about things going on, going on down there. But he'll be here, and you can talk to him, and many of you know him, and it's going to be great to have him around to help out while I'm gone. All right, so that brings us up to date with events, the next two services coming up. I want to open our Bibles to the book of Psalms in the Old Testament. We're going to pick it up in Psalm 19. Psalm 19 is where we're starting tonight. And as we come to Psalm 19, we are in that first book of the Psalms, first 21 chapters, all written by the great King David around 1000 BC. Many of them very prophetic as they are quoted in the New Testament as being fulfilled, including where we're going to end up tonight with Psalm 22. But first we get these cluster of three Psalms, and we're going to get some application out of these. They're fairly short, each one of them. And there's a pretty good application with each one of them. So well, there's always good application, so we're going to get some. So we pick it up in Psalm 19 tonight, and it's to the chief musician, a psalm of David, and we read this. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard, their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. 
and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. It's rising from one end of the heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. So that's describing, of course, creation and God's order and design in the universe is revelation through creation. And now it immediately shifts gears in verse 7. David shifts to a deep revelation through God's word. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired they are than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin, sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. It's a power-packed psalm, isn't it? There's some really neat things in here. Overall, you just, it's David just sharing, like, remember, he's the one that said, when I consider the heavens, what is man that you're mindful of him? Back in Psalm 8. He was the shepherd boy, and he had the graveyard shift, and he'd look up, and he'd think about it, which is good. Pastor Chuck Smith from Calvary Christian Mesa used to emphasize how important it is for us to get away into nature where it's quiet and where you don't have light pollution and you can see the stars. And the reason he said that, and actually he built Green Valley 30 years ago for that very purpose so that a future generation of young people could see the stars and the truth of the matter is, from this psalm, the stars speak. That's what David's saying here in Psalm 19. When we look at creation, and we look specifically in this context at the stars, the moon, and the constellations, we know there's trillions of galaxies. They speak. There's an, there's an awe to them. They were made on the fourth day, and there's an, just an awe to it all. The sun, the moon, and the stars. Oh, it's tr tr trillions. That's a large number. That's a lot of zeros, right? And David was fascinated by that. And he said they speak. When astronomers study the stars, when we see photos from the Hubble spacecraft and things like that, I don't know if you're like me, but I just go like, oh my, look at this. This is crazy. Like you see like this gas cloud and there'll be like a 2,000 stars and another thing here and a galaxy over there. And I'm always like, Wow, and here's a fascinating thing about planet Earth. I studied this with the Institute for Creation Research. In this giant universe that's expanding but dying at the same time because of entropy and sin that came into the world through our head of our race, Adam, it's been well pointed out that planet Earth has a great view of the universe. We could have been positioned in a lot of other places, like other planets, they have a blocked view. It's like when you go to a sports stadium and you have a bad seat and there's a partial blocked view of left field. Or you're right by the beach, but you don't have the, the ocean view. Jennifer and I went to Cayucas not long ago and we stayed at the Shoreline Hotel. Easy to remember, right? Shoreline. It's a really cute little hotel. And we had a little patio that we could see the pier. Cayucas Pier in the surf, and it was a great view, and a little green belt in the ocean, and it, we had a good view. Now, there are rooms that are a little cheaper that you got a view of the, the main street in the cowboy town of Cayucas. You can see the antique store across the street, but you're not looking at the ocean. God positioned planet Earth with the maximum return view of the entire universe, and that's not by chance. That's by design. We're able, the early Founders of science and astronomy and all that stuff, they've been able to see things. Man has been able to see things from the view of this planet so much better than almost any other planet and place you could be in the entire universe. And God designed it that way. He gave us an ocean view of the universe, if you will. And in giving us that view, he holds us accountable to it. In Romans 1, when he actually was talking about the wrath of God revealed against all sin, that Paul was led by the Holy Spirit 
And as after he said he's not ashamed of the gospel, for in it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, then he said, for the wrath of God has been revealed against all unrighteousness, against unrighteous men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, and they deny the creator, and they worship the creature. He went on to say all this stuff. They're given over to foolish minds and darkened hearts. But he said that the entire human race is without excuse. This is important. They're without excuse before their creator when they look at creation. And that would include the stars, the moon, and the sun. Because there's order and design in how God set it up, and because it's so beautiful, there's something breathtaking about a sunset, you just can't grab it though, right? Sometimes I'm just looking at a sunset my entire life when I travel the world, and sometimes with Jennifer and we're down there by Dog Beach on the bike path and we're watching a sunset. I just, it's, it's, sometimes it's over Catalina, but then it moves this way by Palos Verdes, right? In the summer, it's way over here, and it swings like this. And sometimes you just, you just want to like grab it, don't you? Like you just like, there's something about it, you just want to take it in and grab it, but you can't. It's just there, and it's there, and it reveals, it speaks. It speaks not just to me, because I know the Lord, or you because you know the Lord. It speaks to those who don't know the Lord, that Jesus is the Lord. And that's what it says here. There's no speech, no language where their voice is not heard. God holds humanity accountable for creation. And an interesting thought, this passage that we just read, verses 1 through 4, it's quoted in the book of Romans in the New Testament. In Romans 10, where it says, you know, not ashamed of the gospel, well, it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that, you know, he's Lord, that confess, you'll, you'll be saved, right? Romans 10, 9 and 10. But then it goes on to say that the people need to hear the gospel and preachers need to be sent. And if you know Romans 10, you know the context of what I'm talking about. And then all of a sudden, this passage is quoted because how can they hear if someone's not sent, right? That's the passage from Isaiah. How can they hear if someone's not sent? And then this verse is quoted saying, even so, there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. In other words, even where the church hasn't taken the gospel, Creation still speaks of God's glory to those without it. That's the context of Romans 10. And the, the closer on this deal of what we call creation theology or creation gospel is confirmed in the book of Revelation because in the revelation of Jesus Christ in the end of the age when it really is going down and all those things described for us in the apocalypse, if you will, are happening, that the angels come now, we talked about the angels in the Matthew study not long ago. They're coming. They're coming in glory, and they got business to do. But one of the things they do, the book of Revelation tells us, is they go flying through time, space, and matter, declaring the everlasting gospel through creation. They say, worship the creator who made heaven and earth. Isn't that interesting? Now, presumably speaking, that's when the church would already be taken out of planet earth through what we call the rapture. And if that theology is indeed correct, which I believe it is, then the world takes a, a retraction step back in a tribulation world, back to the basic creation gospel, which has been a witness of God since the dawn of creation. So people would ask me sometimes, well, what about the people who have never heard the gospel? Well, that's why we've got to get the gospel to them. But even so, God holds them accountable to a creation gospel. Because there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. The heavens declare his glory, as does all creation. And Romans makes very clear, Romans 1 and 10, that it's speaking, the universe is speaking to the non-believer, that God is a creator, that we're created, and he's a creator, and we'll give an account. And as Solomon said so appropriately in Ecclesiastes 3, he has put eternity in our hearts. And so we know, we know you, people can have darkened minds, suppress things, and all these things like Romans 1 says, but in the end, we... We know he's put eternity in our heart. We're created for eternity. Now we read on. But isn't it nice to look at the sun, the moon, and the stars and know that God created them? We don't worship the sun, the moon, and the stars, but we, know, we worship the one who made them. What is man that you're mindful of? I'm like, it's so nice when they speak. And I just want to go like this. But you just, you just got to just take in the moment with the people you love and say, wow, thank you for this moment, Lord. Now we read in Psalm 20. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation. In the name of our God, we will set up banners, our banners, 
And may the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. Save, Lord. May the king answer us when we call. Occasionally, I will quote verse 7, randomly in a Bible study. I used to quote it a lot, but it's, it's in my database. It's, it's sort of like a play in your playbook that you pull out sometimes. Maybe not as often, but it's still there. Some men trust in chariots, some people, some people, individuals, they trust in chariots, the strength of men, money, power. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. All you have to do is remember the Lord, that he's on the throne and he's in control. I, I love that passage. But I do want to draw your attention briefly for an application down there in verse 4. David's saying, may he do this for you. May, there's, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob be with you. May he send help from the sanctuary. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifices. That's, I like that verse. But may he grant, to you, grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. Now, because of Psalm 37, verse 4, we know what David really has in mind here because Scripture interprets Scripture. Because Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. It's kind of like in the New Testament where it says, seek, knock, and ask, and whatever you ask for, you'll get. Yeah, but we're also told in 1 John, when we ask according to his will, we have what we've petitioned for. You see, that's the key when you harmonize Scripture. And if this just stood alone without knowing more about the totality of the Psalms, it'd still be strong and we could interpret it from the whole Bible as a whole. But really, Psalm 37, 4, because it's in the same first book of the Psalms, we understand what David's really saying is that as you delight yourself in the Lord, as the Lord is your hope, your delight, your passion, as you wake up and you're living for the Lord, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, my faith, our faith, as we're doing that, like we're just, we just got joy in the Lord. We're just delighting ourselves in the Lord and our petitions become to align themselves with the things that he's doing in our life. As Ephesians chapter two says, we are his workmanship. So we're not working to get approval, we're working from assurance, having been accepted in the beloved Jesus through his death and sacrifice on our behalf. So we're coming from victory, and he's moving us toward those things he wants to do in our life, those purposes. To the last day. There's purposes to be done to the last day. Older people have a bucket list. I talked with someone today who was talking about the things they want to accomplish in the year before it's done. You know, my, my writing agent, Robert Yalen, who I shared quite a bit about Saturday night with the cancer and all. And today we're talking about things he wants to do in May in June and to get to Hawaii in December before he steps into eternity. And I'm probably like, well, you know, it's funny because we all have a bucket list. I want to surf the Great Lakes. I've always wanted to surf the Great Lakes. It must be because I was born in Cleveland and grew up swimming in Lake Erie. But there's good surfing in the Great Lakes. And it's one of those things. It's going to happen if I get another three or four years. There's three states my wife and I haven't been to together, Maine, Alaska, North Dakota. I want to, I'd like to do that. I mean, I don't know how serious I am, but, you know, if I got four or five years, it could happen. Those would be some purposes. I'd like to go back to Chile with my wife and go see Patagonia down in the south. I'd like to go to Israel with my wife. I'd like to go to Asia at least once with my wife. Taiwan, Korea, China. I've been to Japan many times. I'd like to do stuff like that. It's kind of like a little bucket list stuff. But really, is that the purposes, you see? Because purpose is different than bucket list. Purpose is what... God has put it on your heart that it wants to be done, he wants to do in your life before you step into eternity. And again, speaking with Robert Yaling today, he's lamenting because, you know, when you know you're on the, when you know you're past a two-minute warning with terminal illness, you know, we always say this, you never find anyone on their deathbed saying they should have worked harder and made more money. You never find anyone on their deathbed saying they should have worked harder and made more money. But you find people on their deathbed or in their final chapter saying, I should have focused on the Lord more. I should have focused on my family more. I should have forgiven those people. I should have given this away. I should have done this and I should have done that. I should have let that go. That's what you hear from people. 
So fulfilling the purpose, Rick Warren's book, Purpose Driven Life, I did a mastermind study on Rick Warren not that long ago. I never realized this, but you realize Purpose Driven Book is, Purpose Driven Life is the most read book, pretty much apart from the Bible in our time. Do you realize how many millions, I thought Rich Dad, Poor Dad with 40 million reads, that didn't even touch Purpose Driven Life. Purpose Driven Life is, in, it's been read by, the, it's in all these languages, you know, he ended up with the, both, you know, Obama and John McCain at his church back in the day at, you know, Saddleback during the 08 or 12 election. He understood that people need purpose. And he wrote a very simple book, Simplicity and Clarity, about purpose in Jesus Christ and purpose for your life. And it resonated way more than Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It's just like we are looking for purpose. Our purpose is found in Christ, in who he is and what he's done for us, being saved by faith, and what he has uniquely planned for each of our lives personally with his calling on our life. That's what we're, that's what we're allowed to do is fulfill that purpose. And it was very neat today to be speaking with Bob Yaling and encourage him, Robert, and to say, you know, what we're doing with this book, this book is going to birth a nonprofit, and that nonprofit's going to be doing the Great Commission long after I'm gone if the vision and purpose that I see with my life is going to come to pass. I've got this vision and purpose, like the, the book, the nonprofit, the Great Commission. We've got my lawyer on, working on it. We're working on trademarks, all this stuff. We're, we're doing it. And I said, Bob, what you're doing with this book, you're not going to see the fruit, but it'll give you dividends in eternity when you're long gone. And Bob, what I'm doing with this book is going to give me dividends in eternity when I'm long gone. I'll see probably more than you. But in the end, who knows? when it bursts this nonprofit for the Great Commission, because the nonprofit, Beyond the Dream Ministries, is for the Great Commission in a future generation. It's, it's for millennials and Zs. It's for my grandkids to be motivated to do what Grandpa Jim Gallagher did with the Bible Training Center in Ghana, what Pastor Joey, the grandfather Papa Joe did with WG and all that we did during COVID with missions and what we're still doing with missions. See, we need to have purpose, we need to find the purpose, and we need to fulfill that purpose, the, pur the purpose in our life. And ultimately, if you're fulfilling the purpose, when you step into eternity, you'll have more peace about what you've done with your life. If you're here Saturday night, I, I said a quote where a pastor asked me if the ministry in Virginia was in vain because the church no longer existed, and I said, stepping out in faith for the Lord Jesus Christ could never and will never be in vain. That's purpose. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We live by faith. It's all part of the journey. You get the miracle walk with Peter, and then you get to sink with Peter. Most of us relate to sinking with Peter, but still, hey, at least a couple steps walking on water. That's a good memory all the way to convalescent care. Huh? Tell, the, tell, the, tell the nurse, <laughs> you know, I walked on water. Hey, Peter can say it. <laughs> yeah, when they were crucifying upside down, hey, you know, I walked on water. He could say it. We all have a unique purpose. And when David says here, that may he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose, I would pray that you would, each one of you, because I can't get after that purpose for you. I got my hands full seeking that purpose in my own faith, my own personal development with the Lord, my marriage, my children, my children's children, my finances, the ministry, the fruit of legacy with people. Just keep going after your purpose. We should all talk to someone who's getting ready to step into eternity. It is very sobering. It'll, it'll just, it's really, it'll keep you sharp. When you're talking about a family gathering for all these grandkids and all this family in May, and you know it's a, like a goodbye gathering, you go around parents, how would that feel? You never know when your last gathering is. That's why when I go on a trip, I put everything in order because I might not be coming back. I always look at it that way when I go on a trip. If I never come back to California and something happens to me, everything will be in order. It'll all run itself the way it's supposed to. But until then, we want to fulfill our purpose. This reminds us to fulfill our purpose, WG. Fulfill your purpose, body of Christ. What is it? What's your greater purpose? I mean, something's obvious, being a good husband, being a gentle and kind husband, 
being a loving wife, an encouraging wife, being godly parents, raising your children under the Lord. There's some obvious purposes. But really, we exist for his glory. We exist for an eternal purpose from before the dawn of creation. There's no randomness. There's only intention. There's a purpose. And we do well to wake up every morning saying, Jesus, you're the author and fisher of my faith. Please show me what that purpose is and keep me going in that direction. So I say to all of us tonight, the Church of Jesus Christ, on April 16th, 2024, may the Lord Jesus Christ grant us according to our heart's desire and fulfill all those purposes he has for each one of us. And may we truly rejoice in his salvation and lift up banners in the name of our God. Yes and amen. Psalm 21. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord, and in your salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. See a similar theme to what we just read there. For you meet him with blessings of goodness. You set a crown of pure gold upon his head. He asked life from you. You gave it to him length of days forever and ever. His glory is great in your salvation. Honor and majesty you've placed upon him. For you have made him most blessed forever. You have made him exceedingly glad with your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. And through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Your hand will find all your enemies. Your right hand will find those who hate you. You shall make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the, f- the fire shall devour them. Their offspring shall dis- destroy from the earth, and their descendants from among the sons of men. By the way, there's many former people groups that no longer exist on planet earth because God allowed them to just dissipate, and many of them are incredibly wicked, and they're gone. Verse 11, for they intended evil against you. They devised a plot which they are not able to perform. Therefore, you will make them turn their back. You will make ready your arrows on your string toward their faces. Be exalted, O Lord, in your own strength. We will sing praise. We will sing and praise your power. So David just rejoicing that God's got it under control. He's going to make everything right. He's got justice with it in this human experience. Verse 1 is a great verse. The king shall have joy in your strength and in your salvation. How greatly he shall rejoice. Two words we really like, don't we? Joy and rejoicing. Joy and rejoicing. It's such a wonderful feeling like when you really are enjoying walking with the Lord and you're sincere with walking with the Lord, where you can just have joy. Like a, you just have this joy and it's not happiness. Happiness is more a choice. Like we choose to be happy. We frame things that, with the perspective of happiness. And you know, as, we, as they said in Finding Nemo, the movie, happy feeling's gone. <laughs> Right? It can go so fast, like happy feelings gone. And we know that life can work like that. But joy, the joy of the Lord is our strength, and we rejoice in the Lord. It's a wonderful thing to come in here twice a week and sing praise songs to the Lord. Our joy is restored. Our perspective is reminded and strengthened, and we rejoice in the Lord. This is a really good feeling when you're walking your neighborhood or walking on the beach, and you're just with someone you love or you're by yourself and, but you have the Lord with you and you just, you just got a smile on your face. You get that little like happy, I want to say a smirk, but that sounds more like something mischievous. You're just like, you're just like why are you happy? I know I'm just happy. I'm happy. I, just, I don't know. Why are you so happy? I'm just happy. Because the joy of the Lord makes us happy. God is good all the time. And even though things can be unraveling a certain way, we know that his joy is based upon who he is, his salvation, what he's done, and we rejoice of where we're headed. We are going to glory. Those in Christ Jesus, we are going to glory. So we have joy and we rejoice. So praise the Lord. Which brings us to Psalm 22 and how come we're going to glory and how we get to glory. The famous Psalm 22. Now Psalm 22 is very much a messianic psalm concerning Jesus. It's quoted numerous times in the Gospels. Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, they all quote it. It's theologically a foundation and cornerstone to Christ going to the cross. It describes crucifixion before. There's no archaeological evidence to show crucifixion happening as we understand it as happened to Jesus from the Romans, that the Romans really invented crucifixion, made a very effective deterrent for crimes, serious crimes. It was capital punishment. 
is a form of capital punishment and public humiliation to restrain evil in the people they conquered and the, their own land that they ruled over, crucifixion. And it describes it around 1000 BC in detail, what it would look like to be crucified from the place of the cross. Now, David is going to describe things in this psalm that would seem to apply to his life. He's not just, it wouldn't seem he's just prophesying completely about Jesus. It would seem, and most people agree, he's speaking about things that happened in his own life and how he felt. But as he was describing these things, the Holy Spirit's given him insight to things that are exactly pertaining to the son of David, a thousand years later, Jesus Christ, and the day that he was crucified. So we pick it up now in verse 1 of Psalm 22. To the chief musician set to the deer of the dawn, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear in the night season and am not silent. This is our opening to this psalm. I've divided it into four segments, all based upon New Testament quotations coming from it. And so there's that famous passage where Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, as he said it in the language, the people thought he was calling for Elijah, remember? Oh, let's see if Elijah comes and helps him. But they were, as so often is the case with the world and the skeptics and the unbelief, they weren't even, they're not even remotely close to knowing what's really going on even practically, let alone spiritually in this situation. Contextually, we can believe that David had a situation where he felt like God had forsaken him. And you can kind of pick which one do you think it was. When he pretended madness with the Philistine kings, when Saul was throwing spears at him, you can just, or when he went to go rescue all the people that were taken by the Amalekites from Ziglag, there's any number of circumstances and situations or when his wife was given to another man. man. We don't talk about that one too much. His father-in-law gave him Michael, his wife, and then he took, the father-in-law took her back and gave her to another man. Like that's just, I don't, I don't, we don't even think that much about that one, but that, that, would have, that would have hurt really bad for sure. Since they say divorce is more painful than death, one can only imagine how much pain that caused David. So maybe that's where he felt forsaken. You have this beautiful wedding day and the photos from your wedding day and then all this goes wrong and you're, you're, you're the prince and you got the beautiful wife who is the daughter of the king and you defeated Goliath and, and your father-in-law hates you and is trying to kill you. Like That would qualify for, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me when you're driven from the palace? There's times in life where we feel like God has forsaken us, particularly when we feel there's been injustice. For example, if you have a court case and there's just no question what's right or wrong, and yet you still lose the court case. He's like, Lord, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This, these things happen in life where they get the wrong call. You get the wrong bounce in the game of life. It just, how does that even happen? But it does. But here's the beauty for us. Both in the Old Testament, when God promised it to Joshua, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, that was a promise from God to Joshua when he was replacing Moses as the leader. Then that same passage is quoted in Hebrews for the New Testament believer, where God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So that's a promise of assurance. We always talk about the, the promises, right? I emphasize four main things with the word of God. The authority of the word of God, salvation in Jesus, and the sureness of promises and the return of the Lord. Eternity. A promise in the Bible for every believer in Christ, is that Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us. People will leave you and forsake you. People might abandon you. People might betray you. Jesus will always do what's good in your life by his spirit, and he will never leave us nor forsake us. No matter how dark the night is, there's, there's still a star out there in the night that says, I love you and I died for you, and I'm coming for you, and I've got a great plan for you, that all this will work together in you and through you for all eternity. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful assurance when you know Jesus to know that he'll never leave you nor forsake you because the world will leave you and forsake you. And I feel bad for people who don't know the Lord when they get abandoned by people they trusted, right? The world is filled with broken hearts and songs about broken hearts and those who broke the hearts. 
Isn't it nice to know when we gather tonight that no matter what's going on, our lowest slew of despondence, pit of mire, that the Lord will never leave us nor forsake us. So you might want to get into trouble and say, Lord, can you just stay outside? I'm going in here and I'm going to have a fit and throw this. He's still coming with you. Jesus, I said, you can stay outside the saloon. No, he's going in the saloon with you, right? See, like, it's, a, it's actually a good thing to know the Lord's always with us. But he's always with us because he is not always with the Father. And the context of this is amazing because if we think about eternity, where Jesus, the Father, Son, and Spirit are one, triune in nature, we go back to Genesis 1 where God says, let us make man in our image. No one has seen the Father, but the only begotten of the Father, the Son, he has declared him. That Jesus came to die for our sins. He never had broken fellowship with the Father. He was always in fellowship with the Father. From another dimension, never out of fellowship with the Father. He saw Satan cast out. He was, he, 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 it was all there. And even as an infant, where we'll see in this psalm later on, where he was dependent upon his nursing from his mother, Mary, and all these things, like the Father was always there, except on the cross. Because hell is outer darkness, gnashing of teeth, and eternal separation from God. And God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all, and Jesus died in our place. And the wages of sin is death, and that death is a spiritual death, separation from God, a physical death, and eternal separation from God. Jesus literally, on the cross, no matter what dimension you come from or go to, or however you look at it, in a prism of different scopes and views, like a kaleidoscope, Jesus was abandoned by the Father on the cross. He was left alone on the cross. That had never happened in any dimension imaginable. That's what he did for us. That's my, this is what people get when they step into eternity. Outer darkness, forever separated from God. Jesus bore that, so we don't have to. Someone's got to pay the price. He paid the price. Because he said, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? We never have to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Isn't that just phenomenal? It's fantastic. It's astounding. It's just, it's, it's theologically so deep that I'm not sure I can even find the right words to express it, but it certainly is beautiful. That's how much God loves us. He was forsaken, so we would never have to be. It's, it's a great truth. Theological truth. Verse 3. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you, and they trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip and they say, they shake their heads saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. So certainly we can see David saying this in his experiences. But again, it takes us back to Jesus in the fullness of prophecy fulfilled. For we are told when he was on the cross, the religious leaders, the scribes and Pharisees, mocked him and taunted him, and they actually quote this passage exactly. He trusted in God. Let God deliver him and bring him down from the cross. If you are the Son of God, come down now. This very passage was quoted a thousand years later by the enemies of Jesus when they looked at him upon the cross, taunting him in his proclamation of dependence upon the Father and trusting the Father for what was happening while he was on the cross and the death he's paying for all of us. He was ridiculed for doing those things that always pleased the Father. Remember, he said that same day at the nighttime, because the Jewish day begins at sundown, Father, if there's any other way, he always did those things that pleased the Father. There was no other way. And we're told in the Old Testament, it pleased the Father to bruise him. Because this was the only way. It pleased the Father to bruise the Son like this because this was the only way for us to be saved. There was no other way. 
we could maybe come up with our mind with ideas like, maybe God could have saved us all this way, but he didn't. It's his universe. This was the only way. This was the only way. Which gives us one thought before we read on in the text. There's a human reality where people are looking for opportunities to blaspheme God and mock us when we trust in God. You know, the longer you walk with the Lord, you younger people, you, you see this. People, when you're walking with the Lord and you have joy and you're rejoicing, like we talked about earlier, sometimes people, because they're fighting God and you represent God, you're the light of the world and they love darkness so they don't come to light. When they see something go wrong in your life, when they see a death of a loved one, they see you get fired, they see you have an injustice and they see things go against you, they, they, they like that. People like that anyways, apart from the Lord. But one of the reasons they like it in a form of persecution is they want to see, they want to try and prove that God's not faithful and God's not good to you. See, David said God is good all the time. Taste and see that God is good. The Lord is good. And non-believers love it when it looks like the Lord is bad to you and they can accuse God through that. Well, if God's so loving, how come he let you lose your baby? If God's so loving, how come your person, your friend was killed in this car wreck? If God's so loving, why did this? And in 36 years of ministry, I, I get that from different perspectives from my own life or other things of other people's lives. It's like, I don't need to answer those questions. Let God be true and every man a liar. God is light and him is no darkness at all. But people want to accuse God. They, people want to see us crucified and then they want to say, hey, she trusts in the Lord. Let's see what the Lord does for her now. Don't let it bother you. Any cross you hang on in time has great glory in eternity. Don't let it bother you. People, people are going to do that. The whole book of Proverbs is about people who mock, people who are fighting the Lord, mocking people who are serving the Lord. Verse 12. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bastion have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like raging and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for clothing, they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. Now, in the context of David, Writing this psalm, I find it very interesting for the man who is in the field with the sheep, whatnot. He talks about the power of the dog, the lion's mouth, and the wild oxen. And when men are fighting God and they're coming against people who are serving God, they do act like wild animals, don't they? Paul even used that description in the New Testament. He called men brute beasts. That when we degenerate from the glory of God, we become just animals and brute beasts and the brutality of war and how evil people treat other people. Well, of course, this passage is describing the cross in great detail. It's describing crucifixion, the bones getting out of place, the thirst. One of the things of crucifixion is you thirst. And isn't that the most horrible thing when you're thirsty and you can't drink water? It Really, like when you really want water and you can't drink water, that is just right up there with the worst experiences you can have. And Jesus on the cross, just a few words total recorded for us. And one of them is, I thirst. He went through that physical suffering for us. Of course, they did pierce his hands and feet. All these passages are quoted in the New Testament. John, Luke has it in great detail in Luke 23. And this is what he did for us. A thought that I had, though, looking at this, it says in verse 18, the well-known verse, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. I never thought much about this, but given it time and perspective and meditation for tonight, I thought, you know, when they take your clothes, there's really not much left to take. When one people conquer another group of people, like this tribe conquers that tribe, like when the Assyrians conquer Israel, they strip you naked and they take you away naked. They'll take your clothes. It's what Hitler did to the Jews. The last thing he did when he took from the Jews is he stripped them, he took everything, he took their clothes. And they got off the train. When they take your clothes, there's nothing left to take. Their world is filled with takers. But younger people, again, listen to me. 
all that you want to hold on to and build, by the time you get in your 60s, you realize, I better figure out a way to give it away. You either give it away or someone takes it away. We have to remember that the vast majority of people in the world tend to lean toward being takers and not givers. And you can't let it bother you. You have to just know that whatever you have, a man can receive nothing, a woman can receive nothing, that's what comes from the Lord. And it's hard when people take stuff from you, but human history is people taking stuff from other people. It starts with me wanting to, not me, but one group of people wanting to take this people's food. You know, it's this Aztec tribe versus that Aztec sub-tribe, right? It's the Incas doing this, and, and then the Spaniards show up, and they do that. Like, this is human history. People taking from other people. We just can't be takers. We're actually told God is a cheerful giver, so we can't be a taker. And really, when, we, when we're stepping into eternity, we don't want to be holding on to anything other than the hand of Jesus coming for us as the good shepherd. So just, you got to let the takers go. They, they took his life, they took his clothes, and they cast lots for it. That's just, that's painful to even really think about. Verse 22, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. And I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship, and all who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. A posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They'll come and declare his righteousness to people who will be born that he has done this. David in context, definitely understood the faithfulness of the Lord in each generation. And one generation shall proclaim your praises to another. That's why I have so much confidence for all future generations, because the Lord's faithful in every generation, because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Another New Testament verse is verse 22. I will declare your name to my brethren. This passage, and in the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. This passage is quoted in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2 where it describes that Jesus had to come and become like a man and suffer so he could relate to humanity. And because he was perfected or matured is a better choice of words, through his suffering, he's able to save us to the uttermost, that he has in all things been tempted and tested like us, that he can minister to us in every situation we face. So really the terminology there in Hebrews 2 is he's not afraid to say we're his brethren, we're like his children, or his brother actually, like a brother and a sister. He's not afraid to associate with us. He's not acting like he doesn't know us when we walk up to this high school cafeteria in that group. He calls us brethren. We're part of his crew. And we're told in that passage of Hebrews 2 that he's our great high priest. And we're told later on in Hebrews we can come to him boldly in time of need, that he's always there for us. See, Jesus went through all these things to redeem us back to the Father the purpose is established. The life he has for us is redeemed of the Lord. And he's for us. He's not trying to ditch us. He's for us. And he's always there. Turn us on with the great assemblies, we're told in Hebrews. And he's for us. So tonight, WG, don't ever forget, God is for us. And Psalm 22 certainly affirms it. Yes and amen. Lord, we thank you for your word here tonight and its application to our lives. And as we've gone through these four psalms, the heavens declare your glory. Their speech is heard wherever we can go. Thank you that you've not left anyone on planet Earth without a witness of your order, your design, your character, the beauty of creation, the, the, the awe and majesty of the celestial world, the design and order. It speaks, and it speaks that you are God, and there is no other. Thank you for that. Thank you that... You, you would want us to prosper in those purposes you've established in our life. You want, you're for us, that our life does have purpose. It does have meaning, not just in general as other believers, but really the uniqueness of each of our lives, Lord. And I pray for that prospering of the, what the plans are for our life. 
that we'd be fruitful, that we would move with faith and fluidity in those things you have for us and stay on point. And Lord, in that journey, we pray for rejoicing and joy that we know the king is blessed and we're all kings and queens under you, I suppose. And so we know we're blessed. And even in the worst day, we have joy in you and rejoicing in you. And we can praise the Lord. And of course, Lord, Psalm 22, these amazing things that David, we don't really know David's whole experience when he experienced these things, but we do know he prophesied of what you would do to redeem humanity. And if we go back to Genesis 3.15, Lord, and that you prophesied that, that the Messiah would be bruised, but he would crush the head of the serpent. And both things happened at the cross. So thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were bruised for our iniquity and our sins. And thank you that you defeated the power of sin, the devil, and death itself on the cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were forsaken so we wouldn't have to be. That is incredible. And so no, no wonder the passage is quoted in Hebrews that, you're, that you call us brethren, that you're, you're for us. We're so grateful, Lord. We ditch people because they embarrass us, and I'm just so grateful you don't ditch us because we embarrass you. So thank you for that. Bless your people tonight, Lord. Take us forward. Pray you bless WG the next week and a half while I'm gone. Bless Pastor Sam as he teaches. Bless Brandon and Anthony and Haley and Dean and all the deacons, all the security people working together for a, a peaceful time. Watch over your church. You always have. You always will. So I just pray it would be wonderful gatherings the next few services with Danny and Olivia leading worship and then Danny Donnelly. And of course, I pray that you'd give uh, myself safe travel and a refreshing time with my family in Florida. We ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Let's stand for this closing song with Danny, available for prayer afterwards. Be blessed, be encouraged, and always forward. I'm happy to be in this truth And I will daily lift my hands For I will always sing Of when your love came down I could sing of your love forever 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 Over the mountains and the sea Your river runs with love for me And I will open up my heart And let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in the truth and I will daily lift my hands For I will always sing Of when your love came down I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever could sing of your love forever. Oh, I feel like dancing. It's foolishness, I know. But when the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy like we dance in I could sing of your love forever. 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 God bless you guys, and we'll see you Saturday.